Well, welcome to the Flower Podcast, Lisa. I'm excited you're here today. Hey, thanks, Scott. It is my pleasure to be here. I have to admit, when I found you on Facebook and started following you a, while, a long time ago, but have recently um, just sort of been tuning into your lives and things, I learned so much from what you offer. Um, it's a tremendous resource. How long have you been doing the lives and just all this education? Well, the education part probably started about 10 years ago, but actually doing lives, the very first live I ever did was for the Cut Flower Association. We decided as an organization, we wanted to do lives. And so I said, okay, I'll be the guinea pig. I'll go first. <laughs> and when I did it, I realized how easy it really was. I mean, I was afraid of the tech part of it because, I mean, I love to speak and teach and all that. So, um, but yeah, once I did it, there has been no looking back. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, I know I'm trying to embrace that more and uh, Instagram live has been pretty easy for me. I just need to switch over and do some Facebook for our Facebook fans. So uh, I'm looking forward to doing more of that. Well, before we, I know we could talk all day because <laughs> you and I just, you know, we have so many things in common and so many interests in common. Um, but before we do that, I kind of would like to go back and for those who don't know, kind of hear your story, how you got into growing flowers, why, um, where, did, where did this all begin? Sure. So it's been a long time since I've told this story. <laughs> um, so I was, I kind of described myself as I'm a gardener gone wild. I was a home gardener. I did not grow up in a gardening home. Started gardening when I bought my first home as a single person started dabbling and then um, I kind of met this wonderful guy. And at the same time, I discovered the book, The Flower Farmer by Len Bozinski. Mm -hmm. And he and I decided to get married and it just so happens he comes, he came with tillers, a piece of really, <laughs> really, really fertile land in the middle of the city. And he was a big gardener. So literally one thing led to another. And I went from a single girl paying a mortgage to a married person that didn't have to put the bread on the table any, or the bacon on the table anymore. And I was able to quit my job that I loved. I was the business manager of a very busy animal hospital for about 15 years. And I was able to quit that job and just dive into doing what that book told me to do. And there's been no looking back. I've just piggybacked onto that flower farming. I mean, flowers and farm and gardening are at the root of everything that I do today. Becoming good at it and efficient um, and sharing that message with other people um, from selling the stuff they need to do it with to teaching them through books and courses and speaking. And um, so it's just been great. So I've been doing it since 1998. And my little farm is in the middle of the city. I'm totally an urban farmer. Um, I, when I first started, we only had an acre and a quarter, including where my home sat. And people are so surprised that the first 10 years, I only had a half acre garden and I still produced thousands of stems every week in season. And um, so we've had the opportunity to buy a little piece attached to us, which brought us up to a whopping 2.85, I think it is, acres. And, um, and that's kind of where we are. So we've gone full circle. I spent about eight years in what we call full high production, where we sold to 23 florists, gosh, two supermarket chains at farmer's markets, an on-farm mar private market, and a subscription drop-off. And about three years ago, I started to take my foot off of that pedal as we dove into more education, um, I was just finishing up my second book, and then we dove into online courses, which have been phenomenal. They're just such an amazing way for people to learn um, an opportunity, and so here we are today. So now my farm is still that same size, but our actual working gardens, gardens more like three quarters of an acre, and, um, and I'm, I think I'm doing now what people dream of a flower farm in farm being. You know what I mean? It's not so high pressure, you know, as being in the flower right. business. When we were producing 10 to 15,000 stems of flowers a week in high production, that is a lot of people and a lot of work every week, week after week. And now it's not like that at all. So we, 
we gave up our florists, we gave up our supermarkets, and we just cater to our own retail customers that are all private. Um, you know, we don't have a market people can visit um, and grow flowers and do a lot of teaching about how we do all that. So it's really pretty awesome. I am definitely living the dream life career for sure. That's awesome. That's awesome. So right now, so you're still growing three quarters of an acre's worth of flowers. Um, and yeah. so you said, um, <laughs> I'll get up and unplug it while we're pausing. Okay. okay. I also took the pig away from the dog so it won't oink. <laughs> um, and I've made me think, I checked my, do you have email on your, on this computer that maybe should be turned off or? Probably. Sometimes that'll interfere with the signal because you're receiving it. Like I just got a text and why am I getting texts? I have no idea. Um, let's see here. Wait a minute, I'm having to find it, sorry. No, you're fine. I, this computer, my computer uh, doesn't link to my wife's text messages, and this one does, so I'm, I'm checking my, on my end as well to make sure. Because I had to be sure I didn't cut us off. That would be me. <laughs> I just exit everything. Okay, so I'm, it's disconnected now. And my phone is also silenced. Actually, I'm just going to cut my phone off. All right. Okay. So I was talking about what you're growing. All right. So right now you're growing flowers still in three quarters of an acre. That's a lot of flowers. And so what are you doing with all those flowers? Yeah, that's a great question. And because people so underestimate the power of a small piece of land to grow flowers, <laughs> we're still producing thousands of stems of flowers a week. And so we'd have, we basically service two groups of retail customers. We have an on-farm private market, which of course in this year, the COVID virus, we've had to tweak that a little differently. Um, but we have about a hundred, I think we have 140 members now. Wow. And um, so there's that. And then we also have a bouquet drop-off service. And we do still service one florist who is our original florist who will just kind of swoop in and take anything we have that, you know, so once a week at the beginning of the week, we connect with him. So, but we use so many of our flowers now for photography and videoing for our courses, our online store for seeds. And you know what I mean? So there's a lot of, it's, we're doing now what we always dreamed to be able to do during those high production years. And you just didn't have time. I right. mean, we're out there ripping our gloves off, trying to fix our hair from hat hair, <laughs> take a picture to use in something significant because there was no time to do that stuff. So now we're just really embracing all those opportunities that we have. Well, one of the things that I think has stood out to me that I'm really excited about is you know, I know there's different people in different parts of the country that have their courses, that have some courses as well. 
but the deal with the heat and the humidity of the south or southeast um, I don't know of too many that are doing that like you are in this part of the country. And so I know a lot of times people say, well, you can do this there, but you can't do that here, which may be true for a flower too. But overall, I think it's just how do you adapt your situation to, you know, being able to produce that flower. Like I, I think of poppies, for example, that's what comes to mind right off the bat because, you know, for years and years and years, you know, people were like, well, you can't really grow poppies in the Southeast, but you could grow, like there were some varieties you could grow, but for cup production, like the traditional oriental poppies and things like that, you know, it was either too hot or they, you know, timing when you plant them. And it's just nice to see, you know, somebody that's producing information that's helpful to everybody in this part of the world. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so we really try to give, how can I say it, the equation for people to apply our growing recommendations to any method or to any environment. We have people from all over the world. Last year, what comes to mind is we had, had a student in South Africa that was in wow. a really crazy situation and you know, so while yes, I mean, we are in the Southeast, um, I'm in the Mid-Atlantic of the United States, zone 7B slash 8A, um, and my book, Cool Flowers, talks about applying that concept that you were just talking about. When do we, those folks that have warm, hot, humid, and long summers grow those cool season flowers, which we can do. I mean, we now grow bumper crops of poppies and, you know, the Iceland poppies that are so beautiful as cuts and sweet peas and snapdragons. Um, so, but the point I'm trying to make is that in our courses, we try to give folks the equation to figure out how to apply what we're teaching them to their winter hardiness zone and their growing conditions. That is key. Um, because it is way different in New England than it is here in Virginia <laughs> or for you down in Georgia. And, but we all just have different planting times and the way we handle things. Mm, that's really powerful because you're right, because then they can adapt it anywhere. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's the point. That's you know, awesome. that's the key. That's the secret sauce. Not just, okay, if you live where I live, this is what I do. Cause we get people that ask us that all the time. I want your planting list. I want to know when you're planting this. And it's like, but you're in Michigan. Doesn't apply. You can grow the same stuff I'm growing, but we plant it at different times. And we teach people when well, my course, which is flower farm in school, the basics, um, that's what we teach them is how to figure out how to do that. And I do think that is so significant. So very significant. Well, one of the things or challenges that I know um, a lot of flower farmers face is how to um, extend that season or extend the profitability of what they're doing. Because, um, you know, just like you just mentioned, depending on where you are in the country, depends on how long your season is. Yeah. And, and how, you know, once that danger of frost or snow or whatever, you know, and then the other side, when spring starts, um, what's the best way? I mean, I, I'm, I know I'm asking you like an entire 20 hour course worth of information in this <laughs> one question, but I'm just curious, you know, what are some highlights or tips for people that, that are trying to figure out how can they start generating revenue later or earlier than sure. they're used to? That's a great question. And something I didn't mention when I was telling you a little bit about me is that I also am a 100% field grower. I have no hoop houses. I really oh, wow. can't here in the city. And we have made lemonade out of lemons. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of ways to do that. So for one thing, um, that book I was just talking about, Cool Flowers, that talks about hardy annuals, um, that increased our profit margin a third because it added a whole nother season of annuals that grow in early spring when it's still cold at night, but just warm during the day. Um, and there's some of the most beloved cut flowers, right? Bells of Ireland, Snapdragon, Sweet William, Poppies, Feverfew. I mean, I could go, well, there's about 40 of them. Um, and so that bought us harvest in April, May, and June in my zone, where then you throw in, so another one of our courses um, with Dave Dowling is Bulbs, Perennials, and Woodies. 
it's mixing up and being diverse. You can really produce um, a good long growing season to produce revenue really a little bit before your season, of course, during your season, and then even a little bit afterwards by embracing, we call it growing seasonally. The hardy annuals, which are annuals um, that love it cool to cold. People have a hard time wrapping their head around that, um, but that allows us to grow earlier and to grow later. And that all together, I mean, we, it has really impacted our, um, our gross for cut flowers. Um, it changed everything. And now that Cool Flowers was published in um, 2014, and I did not make this up. Our grandmas used to do this. You know, they knew, they were so in touch with the seasons because they all had a garden out back, right? Right. They, they knew they planted larkspur and sweet peas at Christmas for when, it, you know, that's a cute little story that somebody was telling, but they knew this. And so I've just rekindled that idea in that book. Um, and it really just holds people's hands and helps them. It's really changed it and particularly for people in very Northern regions where it's so cold for so long, it's really changed everything for them to field grow. Now, if you throw a hoop house in or a greenhouse in, you can produce year round. Dave Dowling's course also talks about that. And we have a brand new course that's launching um, registrations later this winter in November. Um, Steve and Gretel Adams are doing growing cut flower crops in hoop and greenhouses. And let me tell you, they have 17 structures and they grow in Ohio it is going to change people's worlds. Um, wow. And it's just really providing the basics right up to how to really extend what your harvest is and how to do it. Well, you said something and, and I want to make sure I didn't hear that wrong. Um, I get the whole planting, like you said, at Christmas time or wherever for that April, uh, March, April, May yield. But as far as extending it on the other side of like October, November, December, did I hear that right? Like you can. Yeah, you can. And that's a little bit more advanced. Um, so that group of flowers, these hardy annuals are very affectionately and flattering to me now called cool flowers. That's what people actually, actually somebody on social media the other day said, I've heard about this cool flower thing and they were talking about it, but nobody ever said it was a book. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's actually filtered that uh -huh. deep now that anyway, um, the cool season hardy annuals can be manipulated to bloom in the fall. I've had snapdragons and sweet Williams right up to, to um, past Thanksgiving in a good year here out in the field. Um, but that is more advanced. You have to master growing the cool flowers first successfully and then start manipulating and starting them at the because you have to start them in the dead of summer that's hard for a lot of people to do because of heat um but yes you can do that okay well that's that is that's a big deal because i didn't realize um i know here we always planted certain things for harvesting in the spring but never realized you could do some of those tricks maybe it's because i'm usually so busy with everything else i'm like i don't yeah. want to i don't want to add something else to the plate but um well that's awesome that's really yeah cool. so where you are and where i am for cool flowers we plant 90 percent of all of them in the fall do you plant pansies do y'all have pansies in georgia oh, yeah Big time. Well, pansies are a hardy annual you know how you plant them in the fall and then they suffer through winter but they survive that's exactly what the rest of them do and um that's how we have sweet peas bells of ireland i mean things that we have been told for years you cannot grow because it's too hot um, and you can, it's just the planting time has to be proper for them. So now I know that you said that you feel grow everything and you don't have high tunnels, but do you use those low tunnels or the caterpillar tunnels? Do you use that? Um, I do use low tunnels, but we do not make caterpillars. We only use lightweight row cover and it is strictly for deer and wind protection from the, those really? things. Um, and so you don't need them. These, I'm telling you, this group of flowers, many of them are winter hardy to zone six, which is north of me, it means they will take single digits out in the, I mean, I can see the look in your eyes, Scott. 
I mean, it is fascinating <laughs> and I've been doing it for 22 years and it's, you don't have to, we don't fuss over plants here, only the strong survive. And so we strictly use lightweight row covers to keep the deer from trampling our stuff all winter and to protect the foliage from the wind because it just tatters it. And um, so no, we don't use any, um, these, that group of flowers, cool flowers are winter hardy. That's awesome. That, yeah. I love that. Well, and I think that's huge that it can increase. And I think I've already said this before, but a third, I mean, to increase your mm -hmm. production by a third or yep. your dollars by a third, that's, that's huge. That's really And that's huge. the highest demand season, right? I mean, it's like, yeah. you can't have enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we, do, yeah, we have one grower um, that I know of because he does a no-till course for us. They only produce and sell cool flowers pretty much in... Wow. May, I'm sorry, in March, April, May, and June, and then they shut their production down and um, do other things. I mean, how awesome is that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, the worst time of year really is that heat, and yeah. uh, you miss all that. That's incredible. I know I've heard of a few other growers who do that sort of manipulating with their schedule. Um, it's just, I don't know. I think I would have a hard time with that, but maybe not. Maybe I'm, if you make enough money during the you know, yep. you, figured time, you, you figured out, you figured out. Well, I feel like one of the topics that um, obviously you've been successful in, in doing since the very beginning of your business is, is marketing, how to get that, those flowers out there. I know sure. that when we see this huge surge of new growers, people taking courses like what you offer, uh, doing, you know, buying seeds they've never tried before you right. know and I know it's, it's always that old story which comes first the the horse or the cart or the chicken or the egg right. and you know and how do you really develop the market or how do you how do people figure out how to sell their flowers sure and so that is um that is a part of what my course is about about marketing and um, first I want to say if being in business everybody would be doing it <laughs> So I say that because people get so intimidated by the influx on social media, not necessarily out there doing it, um, of people that are trying or attempting um, and maybe just not having all the necessary pieces. Um, part of actually the whole first week's class in my course is all about getting down to the business of what you're doing. And then we talk about marketing and we actually have bonus sessions coming on this year. I mean, you know, COVID changed everything. Sure. A lot of growers who were doing, particularly people that had big farmer's market followings that do these big markets, they had no connections to their customers other than showing up every week. And when there was all of a sudden no market, um, so we're addressing that how to do it um but i want to say that you know and i know that you know this as being a wholesaler you know there's like seven to eight billion dollars a year spent on flowers in the united states alone b as in billion right, right. that is a lot of flowers and 80 percent of that is being imported so in my opinion and after doing this for 22 years there is no ceiling the, the problem is you have to figure out as a small grower how you can find your niche in the market, whether it's selling to florists. Everybody tends to run to the farmer's market. The farmer's markets are definitely overrun, as well as there's a lot of farmer's markets that are not strictly producer only, meaning they allow people in that are reselling, buying from other people. Mm. And that makes for not such a hot farmer's market. So anyway, I coach people on how to kind of sift that, but there are so many opportunities that people haven't even touched on. Um, I was, when I took my foot off the pedal of high production, I was getting ready to make process with making connections with the cruise lines that dock within 45 minutes of my farm. You think they use a lot of flowers? Oh, yeah. They use tons of flowers. Um, I was blessed for 15 years to sell flowers to Colonial Williamsburg. They're 10, 15, 20 minutes from me. They were a huge consumer of flowers. Um, and that I really learned about, I guess I'll call it, should we call it the entertainment venues? These places that maintain places, cruise ships, 
Colonial Williamsburg. I mean, there, I know there's places all over the world that are like that. Um, that's just one of many. There are other opportunities. Um, and I think that we have a long way to go before we, there's too many growers. The point is you have to find your niche and you have to be set up professionally and approach it that way. Um, because I just, we have an endless want to meet the need where I am. And um, I see that just growing and it's changing now, um, which we're addressing our courses to that. I know that Jenny Love is uh, updating her course for people about how to do these new mini weddings, elope weddings, all these different venues and how to do them efficiently and profitable. Um, and um, so I feel like people looking from the outside might think what you just said, that there's so many new growers. Well, they are, but are they selling flowers? You know, I mean, are they doing it? Are they building a business or are they, as I call it sometimes, um, are they tinkering? You know, <laughs> and that's what a lot, I mean, and there's a right. lot, of, and it's because people, we have so many people just like me, a gardener that loved it. And I just happened to find her and it lit me on. And if I hadn't come, I come from a very, um, my whole family is full of a very, a lot of successful entrepreneurs. So I was kind of already had my foot in business and I ran a business for another person, the veterinary hospital. So I had a lot of um, ends to be able to kind of move forward a little quicker than people. I mean, if you're trying to start a business and flower farm, start flower farming, that is a lot. That's why you got to get help, in my opinion, to be successful. Why take 20 years to learn? Learn it in six months to a year and be doing it, you know? Mm, absolutely. No, I completely yeah. agree. So I, that's a great tip, though. I feel like, you know, looking at things like uh, venues that are destinations, like a cruise yeah. ship, like a Williamsburg, you know, in your area, those kinds of places. Yeah. Um, do you feel like, I know that, you know, there's a lot of push towards people not really going directly to wholesale, but trying to go too directly to the flower shop or directly to a CSA model or subscription model of some sort. Um, I know there's pros and cons. I'm curious what you think, you know, if you're going to approach one thing or two things that's like the main things that you really wanna go towards, what, what do you think is the best? Sure. Well, there, I don't think anyone is the best. It's your lifestyle. And that's one of the things that we go through step by step in the course is like, okay, if you want to be a wedding florist, farmer florist, you do realize that 99% of that takes place on the weekends. Right. <laughs> you'll never, you'll never have a weekend off, you know? Um, and so my, my perspective was I spent 14 years going to farmer's markets back when I first started and I never had a Saturday off. And so we took the, we said, okay, we are, <clears throat> I wanna be a Monday through Friday, literally 6 a.m. till two or three o'clock in the afternoon farmer. And so that's what I started restructuring my business to um, and worked out really well. Um, but I tell you something I didn't mention a moment ago that I think is the future of flower farming in this, I mean, domestic flower farming, meaning local to wherever you are in the world, meaning selling flowers, are these new, um, I don't want to call it a co-op, um, but it's where flower farmers either band together to create a wholesale market, or, you know, I even tinkered and then my sister made me come to my senses. I would have loved <laughs> to have funded and started a business that only sold to, on wholesale, local flowers. You know what I mean? It's like, right. Um, to be a wholesaler of local flower farmers, flowers. And that allows flower farmers to farm and it allows somebody to sell the flowers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is really the future. But then on the other hand, I have a really good friend that does three huge farmers markets and they have an amazing business and they love it. So it's all about fitting your need. And that's, isn't that with anything, a job or, right. um, because if you're happy about it, but I think you can find a niche um, in your location and see, that's the other thing that sometimes makes you have to make a choice. Um, I had one gal um, who I actually was her mentor and still am. Um, the first thing she said to me, I live in the middle of nowhere and 
I'm there, I, I'm growing all these awesome flowers, but have no idea how to sell them. And she is selling them like crazy now because she was determined and she found her niche and she did something that I recommended she didn't do. She actually sells um, bouquets on consignment in several different locations. I had a terrible experience with consignment, um, but she has proven that it can be done. So that's what we help people do. There's no one way. It's what you want to do, what you love, your passion, and then what's available. Mm. That's incredible. Well, I feel like, you know, that's, you really summed that up well, you know, look at what you want your lifestyle to be. Look at what you, you know, you got kids, Yeah. you know, I mean, all that stuff right. matters. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think um, one thing I was curious about is with, um, I'm sure you must get a gazillion questions about like with the pandemic and trying to reorganize the business, trying to figure out, you know, what have you been able to help coach people with, with regard to that, or maybe how to structure, um, how to adapt. Yeah. So funny. You should say that. So the week, what was that like mid March or something? Yeah. Somewhere around there. The week that that happened when that announcement came, um, several of my, you know, I was still, um, I mean, I, I, of course I hang out with all these flower farming people, right. You know, instantly everybody's saying, oh my gosh, it gives me goosebumps even talking about it. Now all my weddings are canceling. All my events are canceling. Right. You know, I mean, people were freaking out and I don't blame them. So I said, all right, I want to do a Facebook live. Jenny Love, join me. Dave Dowling, join me. Jonathan and Megan Lease of Spring Forth Farm, join me. And it's me. I th oh, and Ellen Frost of Local Flowers in Baltimore, kind of different angles from the markets. And I said, let's do a Facebook Live next week. And so this would have been like the end of March. And you want to know that by the time we actually had the Facebook Live, we had gone from swinging to everybody being, oh my gosh, my life is over to just in two weeks, oh my gosh, there's so much demand in other ways that we can't even cut fast enough and deliver them fast enough. Um, so it was really fascinating to me. Um, Jonathan and Megan, who only wholesale to florists, they're the ones that, um, they have the no-till course, they only sell spring flowers. Right. And um, they went, from no florist business to all of a sudden, they just went on social media and set up a platform and started selling bouquets and having drop off. They couldn't keep up. Jenny Love did the very same thing. Ellen Frost, the local um, sourcing florist, um, her course comes out in November. She did the same thing. She started doing bucket drop offs instead of making arrangements because she had no staff so that she could help the flower farmers continue to sell their product. And Dave told us stories. He now, he was a flower farmer for 20 years, now works for a bulb supplier um, after he sold his farm. He talked about all these farmers canceling all their bulb orders and then all of a sudden having to <laughs> turn right around and, and, and reface. So <clears throat> we really helped each other to think out of the box. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm a wholesaler, but maybe I'm not now. Cause right. I got a, I got a hoop house. That's what Jonathan said. I got a hoop house full of anemones and ranunculus. I have to sell. And they did it. I mean, it just made all of us so empowered and energized. And guess what? The local community all of a sudden found out that there were these local flower farmers. And now we've edged, we have more people interested in us now than ever before. I think, frankly, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. The pandemic is the best thing that's ever happened to some of our businesses, not everybody's right? because not everybody embraced it and was able to do something. But for those of us that did were able to embrace, it really brought us in front of people we would have never seen otherwise, mm. no, especially wow. florist, especially florists. Right. Right. Well, and I think, I think in a way it really developed this awareness, like you yes. said, that's a good of, word of just, not only, I don't know, I guess we all saw like these pictures of all the flowers being dumped in Holland and all these different things. And then you realize this is, this was also going on in our own backyards in a way with California product and some of the other oh, big yeah. domestic growers. And then, 
And then all of a sudden the people turn their eyes to their own backyard and realize, wow, we've got all these farmers that are, you know, conveniently right here. And, right. and the biggest problem I think was getting the product out and, you know, the people who made the transition to shipping or like right. you mentioned Ellen with the buckets of flowers from the farms. Um, and I know I was, I talked with uh, a lady, I mentioned this, I think on the podcast before and in Australia, I was doing the same thing with these buckets, you know, you're buying these, you know, just a bucket full of flowers that you can play with almost. Right. Um, yeah. You know what else jumped in my mind when you said that about just dumping flowers? The other person that was a guest on that Facebook live was Jonalyn um, Car Carver, Carver in Florida. She was a new grower and she told us that she had the most beautiful compost heap. She dumped <laughs> 2,000 ranunculus. Oh my God. And anyway, but she, like the rest of us, has just ramped up in a different way. But I do also think, just like it always happens, right? that those videos and them dumping those imported flowers was so sensationalized and it really fed us the local people because people were still unfortunately dying and needed funeral flowers so the local florists needed some flowers not as right. much maybe but we were able to step in and fill that need and now guess what they're like whoa these are awesome flowers we can really use your stuff too you know well, one thing that has become increasingly just obvious to me as I've followed you and, and what you do is, you know, you're bringing years and years of experience to your courses and so are the other people that are part of it. Um, I, I kind of wanted to take a minute and break down how you do your courses because uh, you know, different people do things differently, you know, whether sure. it's an all at once download or or what have right. you. And I feel right. like um, the way you walk people through the different steps and how you give people time and it's over several weeks. I kind of, would you mind going into sure. kind of that big picture? Sure. So we offer, um, so I create my own online courses and then I also am a publisher of other people in our industry's courses, people that I actually invite um, to do courses. And so we sell two types of courses. We do on-demand courses, which are kind of shorter, four or five hours or less. Most of them are like an hour and a half. You can go to our website, thegardenersworkshop.com and buy them anytime. Once you purchase a course, it is always yours. However, um, I wanna say, cause you just um, mentioned that you cannot download our online courses and most online courses because you cannot, we cannot protect our intellectual property that way. Mm, right. But you have to log on anywhere you have internet, you log on to your online library and your courses are always right there. So you own them for life. Once you buy a course from us, you always have it. You can watch it as many times as you want. So we have some on-demand courses and then we, uh, what we've really started doing for flower-based businesses um, is we have these schools, as we call them, and they're schools because they're um, dripped out over six weeks to you to not clobber you over the head all of a sudden with like 20 hours worth of videos. Um, it comes to you over six weeks and it lines up in your online library and you can watch them anytime. Um, each, each school course is a standalone course, meaning there's no order. You can take any course course and it's totally inclusive so what happens when you buy one of these online schools um, they only have a registration typically once a year and that is because really unique to our online courses is our instructors are very involved with our students and um, we have uh, a private platform that they have weekly Q&A's during school um, during that six weeks where you get all your questions answered and then we have um, of course like so many people make use of are the closed Facebook groups where all the students are with their instructor and the instructor is in and out of there um, continually during school but even after school they still shepherd those people. They aren't in there every day, but they do drop in to answer questions. Um, and so we really feel like we really have a real connection between our students and our instructors. And we, 
our goal, my personal goal, and it's part of what I say to people when I'm interviewing them to become a, um, to create a course is, you know, you have to interact and we want that shepherding to continue beyond the course. Um, so people can really get help and feel like they can get their questions answered. And so far we've done a great job of it. And then after like, so my course, I've already had two years of classes. So once, if you took my class last year, we have an alumni Facebook group that we then move everybody into. Cause let me tell you what happens. This incredibly unique community develops where people are helping and supporting one another, sharing ideas. And what happens for me, we have a lot of people in the group because of so many years of classes before I can even get to one of their questions to answer it, a student will answer it and say, I think this is what Lisa will say. And in fact, <laughs> it's right. <laughs> so it's like, it's just a, it's an amazing community. And, but it has, you continue the difference between online courses and me traveling and doing 80 lectures a year, which is what I did for the past 20 years up until two years ago, was while I'm there at that lecture, I can answer some questions, but then your relationship with me was pretty much over. I mean, right. I can't answer individual emails, right? But I can answer your question on a platform with all the other students because everybody else gets to see it and benefit from it. So it's really phenomenal. Um, so this fall, there's four of our, four of our schools, um, registration opens, registration's only open for five days. And that is because we get everybody into school at the same time. And then they start getting their classes every week and we have the weekly Q and A. So it's not, people wonder sometimes, why is there just this little short window of registration? Well, we got to get everybody in, then get it lined up and then school starts. Um, and so flower farm in school, the basics, annual crops and marketing and more, which is mine is this fall. Jenny loves um, farmer florist, the wedding process. And she has really, um, done some great updates to address the new situations. Then two brand new courses this year, um, Ellen Frost Florist School, local sourcing, uh, growing your business with local fla sourcing flowers. And I think that is the future of flower shops. Um, Ellen has done a phenomenal thing. And then Steve and Gretel Adams, Flower Farm and School, growing cut flower crops in hoop and greenhouses. So we have a lot going on, um, but the classes run through the winter. So it's a great way. And then you have access to them forever. And um, we're, we're tickled to death. My personal goal in doing all of this is to provide the people the professional help to really build their flower business. You know, maybe you don't want to be a flower farmer. That's what Ellen's story is. She thought she wanted to be a flower farmer and did it for like a week, I think, and realized, er, this is not for me. But she wanted to have local flowers to run her flat, her design studio with. And um, so we're, I'm trying to give them all the tools that they need. That's why we don't have a gigantic course. We've broken it up into smaller, more affordable pieces so people can take what they want. But I will tell you that when people take one course, they take them all. You know what I mean? It's like they just love the, the way of learning and how it builds their businesses. They are, we got some rocking flower farmers um, that are really doing it and doing it for a profit and overcoming all these challenges. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you, um, so do they typically last? Okay, so if they sign up in October, when does that actual course start? So thank you. Um, I go down rabbit holes and forget. Oh, so, you're fine. So, so mine and Jenny's registration is October 1st through 5th. Then the classes start the first week in November. They actually are launched on different days. Um, so somebody could take both of them if they wanted to, um, cause they, but they aren't live. Then on that day, so let's just say on my class starts on that Monday. That Monday morning at 8 a.m. when you log into your library, all of a sudden there's like a bunch of sessions and they're videos. And typically it's about two to three hours worth of little short sessions. We try to have the video sessions be less than 20 minutes because we realize people can like watch them in between doing other stuff and it just makes it more manageable. Um, and there's PDF downloads. So you have that session, you have all your sessions for that week. And then at the end of that week, 
you'll have a question and answer, a live question and answer time with your instructor. And the morning after that Q&A, guess what? The next week's sessions all of a sudden show up in your library. And then when it's all said and done, you can actually go to our website and um, on one of the information pages, it shows a video of me on screen going into my library and showing you the sessions and um, it's really pretty awesome. And then they're there, there's downloads, lots of resources. I mean, we give all the juicy details, where you buy bulbs wholesale, where, who my favorite this is, who my favorite that is, how do you get a business license? Do you need one? You know, everybody really gives, where do you buy greenhouses? What do you think about before you place a greenhouse? Um, because let me tell you, all you got to do is spend a few minutes on some of the social media of folks that are doing their best to figure it out themselves. And it is costly and it takes the most precious thing we have. And that's time. You know, when you become a business, as you know, the minute you say, I want to do this as a business, the number one thing you have to do is get efficient. And what's getting it efficient? Learning from other successful professional people. And that's what we're offering. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you touched on it and I, I just feel like people don't realize, and I do because I've, I've made a lot of those mistakes. We all uh, have. Right. But it's so much cheaper to yeah. learn from someone else in a method like mm -hmm. this than, than, because not only do you waste the money or the resources, but in farming, you waste time sometimes. Yeah. And you either miss your window to start something or yeah. you have to wait another year to do something. Exactly. And it can, you know, and so which a year as we've learned, especially in a year with this pandemic, you know, losing revenue for a long period of time yeah. can be devastating. So um, I totally can appreciate the value of it all. I know when we've spoken in the past um, and I wanted to ask, uh, you know, since you've grown a successful business where you sold thousands of stems, um, I always think of the handful of flowers that are the go-to flowers that everybody really needs to look at. Um, and I feel like you have some great stories and I wanted to know, you know, what are flowers, what, what are maybe the top five that everybody should be growing or should really take a serious look at? Well, it really depends on what your market is, but I, so what I can tell you from my market. Sure. So my market is I wanted to sell flowers to the people that used flowers every day of their life, meaning florist and supermarkets, and then of course, retail customers. And so for us, the top, I'm just thinking the top five would be, believe it or not, sunflowers, zinnias, lisianthus, coxcomb, and celosia plumes. Those are such simple flowers, but they are our top five producers and cash crops and I can sell them to the same people week after week after week through very I mean well commercially they'll take the same color same flowers every week um, but our even our um, market customers you know that we could grow just that we grow a lot of minor crops and a lot of other things in great <coughs> um, but um, those were our top five producers and you know my motto is my course, which if you would say, which course should I take first? It would be my course because it teaches people how to start a business and it talks about getting in with low investment. Everything that I just mentioned with to you, except for the Lysianthus, because we do purchase plugs, but you can start it from seed, but I don't recommend it. Those are all seed based crops. That is low investment, high return. Um, I mean, we planted 1200 sunflowers a week for 26 weeks, you know, that paid for a $30,000 John Deere tractor in one year, if you wanted to look at it that way, you know, wholesale in those sunflowers. And, wow. you know, so it's not nearly as complicated, but I'll tell you what people do. They see all those beautiful bulb crops, ranunculus and anemones and tulips, and they go and invest. And the story that Dave Dowling tells reminded me when you just said about making that mistake, he tells the story about the person that called him that had planted like 5,000 tulips, but they're only about this tall. That's because they bought bedding tulips. They did, they weren't, they didn't know. They didn't know to grow ones for cut flowers. So they had 5,000 tulips to look at for three weeks, but they couldn't sell them. 
that's the kind of information that can just devastate you when you first start. That'll make, make or break you. If you make a lot of mistakes, some people just say, forget this. I'm not doing right. it. Wonderful business and flower farmers burn out because they don't, they're, they keep trying to figure it out theirself and using up all their energy. Mm, yeah. And, and then they get so discouraged, they quit or yep. it ends up, uh, yep. other people see that story and they don't oh, start. I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. I can't do that. I can't afford to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, that's definitely challenging to say the least. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I know I, I've heard, um, I know I've had fun watching you plant sunflowers almost every week. And, and I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of times people don't do sunflowers because of space or because it's a one cut, you know, stem, single cut stem or something like that. But, um, to hear that you bought your tractor basically using sunflower money in one year, that's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. You cannot get enough. Once you get your people hooked, they cannot get enough of them. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> So I know that recently you also did a, a, a live. So people who want to see the whole thing, they can go back and look at it on Facebook. But where you were comparing all these different varieties of sunflowers. Oh, and, yeah. And we did a blog post about something similar to that, but not to the depth you did with just the pro cuts. And right. so, um, you know, I see all these amazing colors that are coming out now. Um, how do you figure out maybe... Uh, do I grow all traditional? Do I mix it up? How do I plan growing a red or a plum or something like that into the mix? Or do you just stick with the basics? Or how do you advise people with that? Sure. So again, well, first, not all sunflowers are created equal. That's a big one. And secondly, again, it depends on your market. For all those years of my high production, we only grew one sunflower in one color, Pro Cut Orange because that was the most in demand. We produced 1,200 a week. Um, it was for our bouquet business, for supermarkets, as well as florists, and they bought them week after week. And it was just too complicated to do more than one color. It was just, and we proved that it worked and other people will tell you the same thing. But then as we started tweaking down and now we're selling to a much smaller pool of people, that is when I started branching out and, and introducing more colors and variation. Actually, my sister, the bouquet maker, insisted. She said, you know, I need some different colored sunflowers, you know, because now we're in such a small pool of people, they need some variety. Um, and so that's when we introduced, I'm a pro cut fan because of how quick they are from seed to bloom, their um, pollenless, stiff necks. But I will tell you all those fancy colors the whites, the plums, the bicolors, they, you pay a price for growing all of them. Their necks aren't as strong, but we figure out a way to use them because people love them. And so they aren't all created equally, but that's why I'm a pro cut fan. Um, that's all we grow potentially a commercially, the only variety. There are others out there because people will try to get into a little, my, my varieties are better. It's like, <laughs> And they're different for different areas, potentially, too, with viruses and, and diseases and stuff. So, um, but yeah, um, I'm a, we have proven that sunflowers are profitable. And you have to, I took me two years to get my florist off of wholesale shipped in sunflowers. But once I got them, oh, let me tell you something. You can, they, there's no comparison in the quality. No, no comparison. There isn't. there isn't. Now, do you start them in the field or do you typically um, start them in, in blocks? What do you start? Oh, no, we start. That's what I do every Friday. Well, most Fridays, I do my weekly sowing of sunflowers and we always start them indoors. It's what all commercial growers typically do. It's just quicker, faster and less work. And we do it in plug trays. And um, I do them on Fridays and with talking to people and showing how to do it. You can go to our Facebook page um, and go back and find one and, and watch me do that. Um, and typically they grow in that for two to three weeks and they're planted out in the field and it is quick and easy. People say, oh, why do you go to that trouble? It's like direct seeding and keeping the weeds down while you're waiting for that seed to sprout out in the garden. And then you got to keep, we got to keep the crows from eating them and the cardinals. Anyway, it's again, efficiency because I'm a professional. 
I don't have time to do all that stuff because we have a gazillion other things to take care of. And so this has worked out to be the best for us. And home gardeners can even do that too. But yeah, that's our real secret sauce. Um, yeah, I know that was always a, that was always a frustration on my part when we would direct sow something. Oh my gosh! It's, it's like how why do the the weed seeds seem to germinate and yep. uh, surpass what I planted um, so quickly? And to be yep. able to have that jump start, and then of course you know using fabric or do you yeah. use fabric or do you uh, use just mulch or what do you we, use? We for? use a lot of. Oh, you mean landscape fabric? Yes. Uh -huh. um, we use some landscape fabric in pathways. I do not grow anything in it. Um, those of us that live in the South that have the weed pressure for such a long growing season, um, the weeds, the grass or whatever you have growing jumps up on top of that landscape cloth and grows in a week of rain, you can almost lose 20 inches of landscape fabric. So you, we can't grow in landscape fabric, but we do use it in some applications and pathways. We use a biodegradable film called Bio360, which is on our website. Um, it's made in Italy. It's made out of corn byproduct. We use that like plastic in some applications to help us suppress weeds. It's awesome stuff. We show you how to put it down by hand. We also put it down with the tractor. Um, and then we do direct seeding into open beds, just meaning just soil and we hoe. Um, and we have some great hoeing videos on our website. And uh, we're going, I only direct seed in the fall, some of those cool flowers, and we're getting ready to go into that season. And you'll be seeing me hoeing in my garden here soon, but there are videos on our website showing how to do it. And it's, again, I hear people, I mean, I hear more belly aching on Facebook about direct seeding and the mess it is and how hard it is and they'll never do it again. It's because just like, I want to say, you're like doing it all wrong. <laughs> I mean, I know I screwed it up for 10 years. Now we finally figured it out and we grow amazingly weed free, amazing crops with little input from us um, doing it. So it's not, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? And there you <laughs> Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that. I'm willing to pay. I'm willing to pay to learn anything if I need it for my business. You know what I mean? And that's why we are where we are. Yeah. No, that's a great point. I really like that. Um, uh, your website uh, has all of this stuff on it, right? Yeah. I mean, you even sell you even sell seed, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. We're loaded. We um. So basically, it all started. Started flower farming. Then I started teaching and then people wanted the stuff I use. So I launched an online garden store in 2005. We do not save seeds, but we buy the same, buy extra of the same seeds that we plant and we package them with our instructions, which is what's different about them. Um, and then we sell the tools and supplies that I use like the hoe, only one hoe. You won't find a big selection on our website because we only sell what we use. Um, so yeah, so my books are there, all the tools, seeds, and supplies, and then all of our online courses. And there is a ton of free videos. Um, and my blog is there. And you'll be the first to hear this. We are launching a blog a podcast. Um, it'll be along with my blog, um, which is called um, Field and Garden. So it'll be about farming and gardening. And um, so that'll, that's, it's all there at thegardenersworkshop.com. And if they sign up for my newsletter, they're on the website, they won't miss anything. Awesome, that's great. Well, Lisa, this has been so good, so much information. I can't wait for people to get it. Um, thank you so much, and um, I look forward to your course. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been my pleasure to be here, and I look forward to um, chatting again sometime. <laughs>